reading from the 13th of Luke, beginning in verse 22. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will it be those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us. And he will answer you, I do not know where you came from. Then you will begin to say, but we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some who are last who will be first, and some are first, who will be last. Father, our prayer is that we'll, we will not be those who think we are first and will be last. For to be last would be to separated, be separated from you for eternity. I pray this morning that you will give us insight into this, your word, as you try to help us understand the severe nature of the consequences of rejecting you. As you help us to understand what the alternatives are in eternity. Such an, such an important message. So inadequate to deliver it. And so we pray for your Holy Spirit to sweep through our midst, Father, with power and with great compulsion in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You've probably noticed by now as we go through the book of Luke that Jesus never watered down his message to avoid offending people, right? He didn't do that. We think of him that way, but that's not the way it played out. He wanted to do one of two things. He wanted to make them feel bad enough to repent or furious enough to reject. But at least they would have to come to the crossroads and make this great decision. And to help clarify that, this one person, the only person, person who has ever lived, who came from eternity to earth, is going to tell us what it's like on the other side. He's doing that strictly for the reason to help us come to the right conclusion. With eternity at stake, Jesus does not beat around the bush. He knows that there are many, like the Pharisees, who think they are in, think they're okay. Absolutely positive that salvation is theirs and that heaven is what they can look forward to. So he lovingly warns those who are rejecting him of the consequences. As we've seen in previous weeks, someone asked in verse 23, Lord, are, there, are those who are saved, will they be few? He answers by saying, you must Come in, the few will come in through the narrow gate labeled repentance and labeled Jesus Christ. It's the only way. Those who reject will go on on the broad way on which they were born. And so he gives this shocking sermon to the Pharisees. We've, we've outlined it in three parts. Few will be saved. We looked at it a couple weeks ago. Many will be lost. We looked at last week, but today it pays to be saved. I pray that you will see what Jesus wants us to see today, how critically important this is. What does it mean to enter the narrow gate? It means a difference, beloved, for all of eternity. And that's what Jesus is trying to clarify here. There are only two alternatives in eternity. There's not a third door. There's only two. To help us make the right decision, he wants us to understand what is on the other side of those doors. And so while the narrow door may look restrictive in this life, not in the end, not a hundred years from now, not a thousand years from now, not a million years from now, it won't look restrictive though it might today. 
And so he gives us these two contrasts, the revulsion of hell, the rapture of heaven. So let's look at them. Four things about hell that I see in this passage. Number one, it's real. It's real. It's real. We don't talk about hell often. The only time you hear it in our culture is when it's used as a swear word somewhere along the line most of the time. But Jesus talked about it. He talked about it more than anyone in the Bible. And in verse 28 of our passage, you'll see that he says, in that place. Hell is a place. It has substance. It's not just a symbol or a metaphor or whatever else you may have implanted in your mind to ease your concern. Hell is a place. It's a created place. Say, where do you get that? Matthew 23, 41, where Jesus says the eternal fire, calls it the eternal fire, prepared, created for the devil and for his angels. Unfortunately, many people will join them there. Now, you notice in the Matthew passage, he calls it fire. Always the question, is the fire real? And the answer to that question is no one knows for sure. Jesus constantly used that terminology. But whether it is real or whether it is symbolic, if it's real, it speaks for itself, right? If it's symbolic, we never use words that are symbolizing something unless they, the reality is worse. And so there's really no comfort in thinking, well, maybe it's not real fire. <laughs> the point is it's an awful place. That's what Jesus is trying to get across. It's awful and it's forever. Jesus calls it in, in Mark's gospel, chapter 9, verse 48, he calls it a place where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. We'll come to this later in the book of Luke and look at it in more detail. Beloved, if, if, from the standpoint of the New Testament, if we all just had a five-second glimpse of hell this morning, we would all be on our faces before Almighty God begging for mercy. We would. And that's what Jesus is trying to do here. He's trying to give us that glimpse to help us understand this particular consequence, this particular alternative. He warns again in, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 43, Listen to what he says. Just listen to this. He says, and if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes and to be thrown into hell. You get the point. It's real. It's inescapable. It's permanent. That's why Jesus is saying, listen, the best thing I can tell you would be better to go through life with one arm, with one leg, with one eye than to enter eternity without me. That's how... Real it is. Hell is real. Secondly, hell is regretful. It's regretful. Can you imagine, try to think about this, can you imagine infinite regret? If you can think about what that would be like, that's hell. One aspect of hell. Verse 28, he says, in that place there will be weeping, there will be no end of tears there, tears of surprise, of joy, I mean, of, of, of surprise, of shock, of pain, of surprise, of regret, the part of those who thought they were going to heaven, those who thought they had it covered, those who thought there was no heaven or hell, didn't think they would have any life beyond the grave, and here they are suddenly, and they're going to be forever in this place of torment. Finding out finally that without Christ there is no hope and they went into eternity without them. Listen, <clears throat> the regret will stem from many things, but one of the things it will stem from is they will remember back to a day, back to a time. Perhaps for some here this morning, it will be this day. 
They will remember back to the time when they could have said yes, when the compulsion of the Holy Spirit in their life was so strong and they wanted to say yes, and yet they said no, or perhaps later. The thing Satan would most like for us to say, beloved, is just later. I'll just put it off till later. Because for most people, later never comes. About three years ago, one o'clock in the morning, there was a man named Jeffrey Giuliani. He lives in New Fairfield, Connecticut. He was awakened at one o'clock in the morning, fifth grade school teacher. He was, it was a phone call from his sister who lived next door to him. And she said, I think, there is, I think there's an intruder outside my home. Would you, would you mind checking it out? He said, of course. Grabbed his coat, grabbed his pistol, and he went outside to check. Didn't have to go very far before he ran into the, into the intruder, had a hood on, he, his face was covered with a ski mask, and as soon as he saw Jeffrey coming, he ran toward him and attacked him. In the process of the fight, of course, Giuliani shot him and killed him. When the police came, Naturally, the first thing they did was take off the ski mask. And Jeffrey Giuliani immediately fell to his knees, weeping uncontrollably. He had just shot and killed his 15-year-old son. Nobody knows why the boy was there to this day, what it was he was doing, what he thought, what kind of game he thought he was playing. All his dad knows is that he shot his own son and killed him. He told the police, if I could only just live that one moment over. But the moment is gone. That's what hell will be like. The if onlys, the what ifs, will bounce off the walls of hell, beloved, forever. It's not my desire today to scare people to death. But this is the words of Jesus. He's trying to tell us what it's like because he wants us to come to faith. You know, I find in the Bible, Jesus didn't hesitate to use the positive and he didn't use the, hesitate to use the negative reinforcement to get the message across. He just told the truth. The great Spurgeon said this, one of his sermons, he said, if you are lost and cast away, you will have to bear all the blame and all the tortures of conscience yourself, forever reflecting, I have destroyed myself. I have made a suicide of my soul. I have been my own destroyer. Believe me, beloved, the time to repent is now. Hell is regretful, eternally so. Thirdly, hell is raging. Hell is raging. It's a place of raging fury. It says in verse 28 again of our passage, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. This passage implies that unbelievers will see believers in glory prior to being cast out and it will cause gnashing of teeth. The term gnashing of teeth is not one that is speaking so much of pain, although there will be that, but it is speaking of anger. It's uncontrolled anger. Job says in Job 16, verse 9, he says, He has torn me in his wrath and hated me. He has gnashed his teeth at me. Anger. Imagine a caged lion, you know, and somebody comes along and teases him. Safe outside the cage, right? But the lion bares his teeth, wishing he could get out of that cage and get at this person. He gives a roar of anger. When Stephen, some of you remember the account of Stephen, the first, one of the first martyr in the church, in the book of Acts, chapter 7, He's, he's called in, he's brought in before the, before the leaders in the land of Palestine, Israel, where they lived in Jerusalem, and he's called to task because he's been preaching Christ. 
It always puzzles me why they called Stephen. I think they had had the apostles in there a couple times. It didn't do any good. One of them had already escaped, and so they called Stephen, thinking he's a little further down the ladder. But whatever the reason, Stephen's there. And they call him to task for preaching the gospel. And Stephen gives an amazing sermon. You want to read it sometime. He gives the whole history of Israel. Some of the things we know about Old Testament Israel come from the sermon that Stephen gave that day. But when he gets all done showing how the whole Bible up to that point had been pointing forward to the Messiah, to the Jewish Messiah, and then he concludes, and it was Jesus of Nazareth, and you killed him. The Bible says in Acts 7, 54, now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth. It's the same word that we have, same phrase that we have in this passage. They gnashed their teeth at him and you know what they did. They took him out and stoned him to death. They hated him. Just as those in hell will hate the very idea that the Jesus they refused would now cast them out after all the great things that they had done to earn their way in, how dare he do that and hell will be filled with their fury for all of eternity. The sin will go on and on and on and on. In Matthew 7, 22, Jesus depicts people as begging to stay in heaven based on all the things they've done for him. You remember the passage. These who come before him and they say, did, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? All these wonderful things they had done, but they were all done however good they may have been, however even miraculous they may have been apparently because they wanted to stay on their own terms. They were doing it to earn favor with God instead of accepting what Jesus had already done for them. It won't work, beloved. And when they are not able to stay, when they are cast out, they gnash their teeth in anger at God. Hell is a raging place of raging, uncontrollable anger forever. Like Judas, they will be remorseful but not repentant. They will hate God. Look what Jesus says at the end of verse 27. He says, I will, that he will, that, 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 that they will be told, depart from me, depart from me, all you workers of evil. How, how can Jesus say that? His audience is a bunch of Pharisees. These are not terrorists and rapists. They're the people that are working the hardest to be right with God. They're the people that are trying the hardest in their society to keep the law. How can they be evildoers? You, we, we have to get this across to our feeble minds. You can't earn God's approval. You can only accept it through the person of Christ. Because they insist that their good is better than what is needed and is better than the Christ who died for them, they are evil workers. They would never accept the fact that God had pointed out in Isaiah 64, 6, all your righteousness, all of your righteousness on your best day is like filthy rags. They would not accept that. They would not get that. They're the worst kind of evildoers because they declare themselves true and God a liar. And so he will say, depart from me, you who work iniquity. And that phrase will resonate through their minds for all eternity. Fourthly, hell is wretched. I think the worst part of all is in verse 27 when he says, depart from me. I don't, I don't think we understand what it means to be placed outside of the any kind of manifestation of the presence of God. We experience the presence of God today in ways that we don't even know. Paul says God causes the rain to fall on the evil as well as on the good. We all are experiencing God's common grace on a daily basis. The air we breathe, the next breath you take comes from God. The ability to have it comes from God. We experience God's presence, but in this day there will be no more presence of God. Depart from me. That's the end of hope. Do you ever hear anybody say, oh, you can have heaven. I'll take hell. My, all my friends are going to be there anyway. I'll be there too. Big frat party, right? Hell is the big frat party. It's not going to be like that. 
Hell is gonna be a place of utter aloneness, severe loneliness. Matthew chapter eight, verse 12. Jesus describes hell this way. He says that unbelievers will be thrown into the outer darkness. No light, no human contact, no godly contact, no contact of any kind, just utter and complete darkness and aloneness forever and forever. Desolation of hell, beloved, will be absolutely devastating. Wretched doesn't even begin to describe it. You know what happens in hell? People who have lived and insisted on being at the center of their own universe, which is most of us, right? People who have insisted on being at the center of their own universe, God will finally say, fine, have your universe. You are now the center of your existence. There is no one else absolutely alone. Hell is the demonstration of the utter bankruptcy of human arrogance. You thought you could do it. You thought you were good enough. You thought you could make your own way. You thought your world was the most important thing. Here you are. Hell will be, give, be God giving people what they wanted, a completely self-absorbed existence. But as philosopher Cornelius Plantigan reminded us, he said, the image of ourselves as center of the world is a fantasy, even a form of madness. It's like pulling the plug on your own resuscitator. It's true. We're made, we're made for companionship. We're made for companionship with God and we're made for companionship with others. Loneliness is a killer. And there's so many illustrations of this. The Japanese found during World War II the best way to get information out of men wasn't to torture them, it was just to put them in solitary confinement. It didn't take long with no, absolutely no human contact whatsoever, not even with their captors. It didn't take long before they were ready to talk because we're made that way. The, the actress, Inger Stevens, some of you may remember, played on The Farmer's Daughter years, many years ago. She said this, beautiful young woman, she said, sometimes I get so lonely I could scream. She said that just before she took her own life. If you think about it, if you can be that lonely with people all around you, what's it gonna be like when there is absolutely no contact whatsoever in to engulfed in total darkness with no God, no, no one else, just unendingly alone? This is hard, is it not? It's a hard message. But it's Jesus' message. Beloved, it's not mine. I take no pleasure in trying to illustrate what Jesus is saying here. But I want you to understand that Jesus is saying, this is the alternative. If you reject me, this is where you're going. This is what you have to expect. But what about the rapture of heaven? Thankfully, there is an alternative. There is a door number two. There's no door number three. But there's a door number two. Verse 29. Really, middle of verse 28. He says, when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. In verse 29. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. This is heaven in full bloom. What a contrast to hell. What a contrast in these two alternatives in eternity. And that's what Jesus wants to do. But I'll tell you what, the Pharisees would have hated this. They didn't believe this for a second. Why? Because Jesus is picturing for them, there's Abraham, your father. There's Isaac, one of the patriarchs. There's Jacob. There's all the prophets in the Old Testament. But guess what's missing? You are. You're not there. Is it possible to miss heaven? Is universalism true? Aren't we all going to be saved eventually? Not according to Jesus. Don't buy that lie. You'll not be there. But here are the 
patriarchs. Here are the believers from the Old Testament. From the Pharisees' point of view, worse ever, here's people from east, west, north, and south. What does that mean? Gentiles. Whoa. Gentiles are going to be there. All kinds of people from all kinds of, of groups. You know, it reminds you of the book of Revelation where every tribe and every tongue and every nation will be represented there. What a wonderful place it will be. But the Pharisees had missed it. They, they thought keeping the old covenant law was the way to get in. They missed in what, the, what the Old Testament had been saying. It's the, new t- it's the new covenant, forgiveness and cleansing of the heart and the heart and the, and the law written in the heart and responded to because of love for the Savior who had died to provide that salvation, that cleansing and that forgiveness. That's what was necessary. It was, always, it was never about keeping the law. It's always been about grace. It's repentance that moves the last person in the line to the head of the line and into heaven. And it's lack of repentance that moves those who think they're at the front of the line to the back of the line. The narrow gate. Heaven awaits those who believe. Hell awaits those who reject. It's kind of that simple. And we can say about, a lot about heaven, but let me, just, let me just talk about four characteristics today. We'll see more later on in the book of Luke What's heaven like? Number one, no sin. There is no sin in heaven. Finally, at long last, we have the end of sin and all that it represents. It will be done away. Heaven is the reversal of what was going on in the Garden of Eden so long ago. What was the Garden of Eden all about? It was about God giving some people, some, the first people that he ever created, Adam and Eve, giving them the opportunity to pass a simple test so that they, begin to, so they can begin to um, move from a, from, a, from a position of innocence to a position of absolute holiness before him. They would have been, I believe, confirmed in holiness eventually, but as soon as they sinned, not passing that simple test, fallenness entered the world, brokenness entered the world, everything was touched by it, from people to the nature, to the nature that we live in and everything else, everything polluted by sin. And so what's happening here is the reversal of it. There will be finally no more sin. And all the results and all the brokenness and everything that attaches to sin will be done. John says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, he says, this is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. He says, beloved, we are God's children now. In other words, he's saying, this is great already. Chasing nothing yet. Now are we God's children. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Does Jesus ever sin? No. You're going to be like Jesus? Yes. Will you sin? Ever again. Never again will you sin. Never again will temptation be able to touch you. Never again will you have to face the effects of sin in the lives of other people. Never again. It will be done away. Sin will be done. Jesus says in Revelation 21, verse 27, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, heaven, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. Imagine living in a place of sinless perfection. That's heaven. All the effects will be done away. No disease, no infirmity, no disability, no emotional trauma, no despair, no wondering. All the effects of sin will be done away. No sin. Secondly, no sorrow in heaven. Be no sorrow kind of follows, doesn't it? There's no sin, there's no sorrow, there's no reason for sorrow ever, no disappointment, no pain, no suffering, no regret. Heaven will be the absence of all these things. Revelation 21 verse 4, and I know I'm going through some of these passages fast, there's just so many to look at, so take them down or they're at the bottom of your outline if you want to look them up, beloved, but let me read this for you. Revelation 21 verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, no crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. No weeping there, not in heaven. No weeping. Nothing to cause it. I love, somebody asked Helen Keller. You remember Helen Keller, the great... um, a great uh, woman who had, at the age of 19 months, lost her hearing and her eyesight because of, because of a high, very high fever. 
And so she lost the ability to communicate. She had the teacher, Annie, who came along. So you've all seen the story, how she learned to communicate by means of her, of her sense of touch. And eventually she could actually speak to some degree. But someone once asked her, she said, do you believe in life after death? She said, oh, I most certainly do. It is no more than passing from one room into another. She had her theology straight. Then she was quiet for a moment before she added this. She said, but there's a difference for me because in that other room, I shall be able to see. I shall be able to hear. And so will we all, beloved, face there the fact that there is no sorrow. We, it's all removed. There's no reason for it. There are some things that I don't know how we could have no sorrow about. For example, what if, what if you have a loved one who is not in heaven? How does God take care of that? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I just know there will be no sorrow there, no mourning, no tears. God will wipe them away and they'll be gone forever. No disappointment, no sense of loss. Heaven will be absolutely amazing. Thirdly, there will be no spite in heaven, no gnashing of teeth in heaven, no hatred there. That unbeliever, you know the one I'm talking about that has all the rough edges, doesn't meet your standards, the one you don't want to be around, you're going to love them in heaven. You're going to love them. You're going to think they're the greatest person going. That's what heaven is going to be like. The person you can't stand will be there and you will love them. You've all heard the little ditty, you know, to live with, above with saints, to live above with saints we love, well, that will be glory. But to live below with saints we know, well, that's another story. That's how we feel sometimes, right? Tough to live with, those are around us. Not in heaven. You're going to love them there. You might as well start loving them now. <laughs> might as well get used to it. Go out of your way to love the ones you least love. That's what heaven is going to be like. Prepare yourself. You know what? Above all, we're going to love Jesus. You imagine being in Jesus' presence. You know, I, it's a good thing heaven is forever, right? We're all going to want to be with Jesus. Thankfully, with enough time, we'll all get our chance. That we will love others there too. We will have time to spend with Moses and Elijah. We'll have time to spend with John and Peter. We'll be able to ask them all the questions we've wanted to ask. I don't know if you can keep your list with you, so you'll have to memorize those, but you'll, I'm sure they'll come back. All these questions, these things I wanted to say, these things I wanted to know, you're going to be able to ask them. You'll meet your family. Mom and dad who have gone before. You'll be able to see them in heaven. Heaven is a place of no regrets. There are no what ifs. There are no if onlys in heaven. We used to sing this wonderful little chorus. Maybe some of you did as well when we were kids. You know, heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I'm going to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. Heaven's a wonderful place. Don't you want to go to heaven? There's no solitude in heaven. Hell is a place of utter darkness and devastating loneliness. Heaven is just the opposite. It's just the opposite. Revelation 21, verse 23. The Apostle John says, And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it and its gates will never be shut by day and there will no be, be no night there. No night, it's all light, all the time. The light of the world who was rejected by the world will light up the universe that we live in in the future. And we will all glory in it. There's a passage in Matthew that even says we will all shine <laughs> with glory, reflected glory, reflection of the glory of the Son of God. 
We will glory in it. There'll never be any darkness. There'll be companionship. Jesus is our companion, loved ones, friends, all these people. Luke 13, verse 29 says, and people will come from the east and from the west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom. There are going to be lots of surprises there. Can you imagine? There are going to be converted Muslims there. You're going to love them. There are going to be converted Hindus there. There are going to be converted Buddhists there in heaven. There are going to be converted rapists. Converted child molesters will be there and you're going to love them all. Heaven will be a wonderful place. The first will be last, but the last will be first. Revelation 7, 9, after this, I looked in a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb. There will be no solitude there. And everyone who is there will know this. Salvation is of the Lord. We will be singing. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. I so, my heart goes out to people like this. Woody Allen once said, there, there may be an afterlife, but no one knows where it's being held. He couldn't have been more wrong. Jesus knew where it was going to be held, even on the cross. Remember how he said to the thief who was next to him? The thief who was repentant, the thief who recognized somehow. <laughs> he got more straight theology in, in a shorter time than anybody, I think, in history. That thief on the cross. Because he went to the cross mocking, according to Matthew. But boy, he left it differently. He criticized his companion who was who was mocking Jesus by the time he was done, he recognized somehow, somehow he recognized whose presence he was in. And he said, will you please just, just remember me when you come into your presence? And Jesus says, remember you? Let me tell you, let me give you good news. Today, before this day is over, you're gonna be with me in paradise. Listen, if heaven is a place, hell is a place, but heaven is a place. And, there's, and you don't have to wonder where it is. You don't have to wonder where the afterlife is being held. Today, Jesus said, you'll be with me in paradise. Think about this, beloved. This is real. This isn't just fairy tales. By the end of that day on the cross, Jesus is walking the streets of heaven with this thief who was, behind, who was beside him on the cross while the other one is in eternity of separation from God. That's how distinctly different the alternatives are. And Jesus wanted us to know that. What a contrast. Let me close with this. These are, this, these are subjects that I am so unworthy for. But I had a friend who was president of Biola University for a number of years. We used to play basketball together before, before he got that high. He was a little better than I was. He was the player of the year in California in 1953. And then he played a lot, of, by a, a lot of basketball at Biola and in other places around the world before he became a missionary in Philippines. And then he became a teacher and he was my teacher, a couple of classes in college. And then we became colleagues on the same faculty at the seminary eventually. And then he became president of the whole thing. 25 years as president there, did a wonderful job. He died a few years ago, just God's providence in his life, decided it was time to retire, got his successor in place, and nine months later he was with the Lord at the age of 72. Heart problem. Clyde always had a keen sense of humor. It was a very um, dry sense of humor, but had a keen sense of humor. I can still remember him talking, trying to, trying to talk to people about the need to give he said, you, you know, you can find ways. You can find money. If you want to do it, you can find it. And he would tell him, you know, go out. you're going to buy a new car? Get black walls on the car instead of white walls. In those days, I guess it made a difference. I don't, I don't think it would matter today. But, it, you know, the white walls were more expensive in those days. And he said, look, look. He said, you're going to be sitting in the car, so you're not even going to know the difference. <laughs> and he said, all the people that are looking, they don't care. 
just get black walls. It was wonderful. But at his memorial service, he had prepared a, he had prepared a tape that he had played. He requested that this be played as though he were talking to the audience from heaven. Let me read part of it for you. He said, Dear Annabelle, it's his wife, obviously, I love you. It has been cold there in my shadow as I have had all the glory and you the strain. But nothing significant would have been accomplished had you not been the wind beneath my wings. And I thank God for you. And the rest of you, you might think it's strange to be listening to me now, but wasn't it Dwight L. Moody who said, one day you're going to read that Dwight L. Moody is dead. Don't believe it. And he was right. I'm more alive now than I have ever been. It's so wonderful where I am. The city is fascinating. There's no need for sun or moon because the glory of the Lord illuminates every single part of the city. And we walk in that glorious light. And it's always day. Besides not having any night, there is nothing here that is unclean and no one who practices abominations or lying. There are no tears, no death, no mourning, no more crying or pain. It's just like the Bible said. And oh, the music. I thought the Biola Chorale was fantastic, but let me tell you, it's unbelievable here. When you hear that voice of the multitude singing praises to our wonderful Lord and Savior, it is as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty peals of thunder. And then he goes on and describes the worship for a little bit. And then he says, when I'm not worshiping, I'm asking questions. All those hours as an undergraduate in the Biola residence halls, staying up late to discuss the sovereignty of God and the free will of men and women. The answers are so simple once you get here. Oh yes, and predestination? Wish you could have seen the twinkle in John Calvin's eyes as we discussed that. I was even able to get five minutes with Moses. Well, I really don't know if it was five minutes because a day here is as a thousand years. It just seemed like five minutes. Anyway, I asked him about Genesis 1 and 2. It really happened just as he wrote it. I'm in no pain, just overwhelming joy. Believe me, it's tearless here. And it's all true. Every word of the blessed book. Trust it. And trust our beloved Savior. I'll see you at the trumpet blast. Wow. You should see the size of the trumpets they have ready. Or if you too have to pass through the valley of the shadow of death before he returns, I'll meet you here. And if you happen to be listening to this and you have never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, oh, I urge you to do so today. What better time to number your days and apply your hearts to wisdom and the good news of Jesus Christ than at a service like this. I want to see you again. I love you. Goodbye for now. You say, is it that real? Absolutely. It is. But you have to enter through the narrow door. It's not just the narrow way, beloved. It's the only way. Let's pray. Father, the sorry I've been such a wimp here today, but the but the magnificence of your presence and of the place you're preparing sweeps me off my feet. And I pray that it will those who are here today as well. Father, we cast ourselves on your mercy. We realize there's no possible way we could ever match up to the glory of heaven. Even the very, 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 very best of us, if we entered heaven without you, would taint it immediately. We would. Our selfishness, our sin would make it anything but heaven at that point. So of course you cannot allow that. 
But for those who are covered in the righteousness of Christ, those who have traded in their sin for his righteousness, like you say in 2 Corinthians 5.21, where you say that you made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We claim that and we trust that. And as you have now made us ambassadors of that, we beg and plead with others to come to faith in you. Lord, just if, it, if, if, we, if we really could see how real it is, our lives would change immediately. So please make it real. It's what you're trying to do, I know, and I pray that it, it would come alive to us. We'd see it as you see it. Help us now in these moments as we sing this hymn together, decision time, asking what it is you want from us. Perhaps there are some here who have never trusted you as Savior. They need to just bring their sin, repent of their sin, turn away from it, trusting in the sacrifice Jesus made on their behalf on the cross, saying, please be merciful to me, a sinner. Help them to do that now. Perhaps others of us, Father, it's now seeing anew what the consequences are. That there's just door number one and door number two. There is door, no, door number three, but we've got friends and neighbors and relatives and loved ones who are headed for door number one. Lord, give us a compassion. Give us a heart. Not a harshness at all. Not a self-righteousness at all. Just a firm faith that this is the only way. And so just as we would share the solution to cancer with somebody who had cancer, so we want to share the solution to eternity with somebody who has lostness still at the heart of their soul. Bring us to yourself, whatever the decision we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.